Hello friends, Hiroshi Shipe here with a special edition of F Society RC podcast as I review the movie Pulp Fiction. Now this movie has been alluded to, um, has some kind of direct shout outs uh, th- throughout the series. Uh, one in particular is just a direct reference to the film itself was when in season one when they were doing the flashback of Elliot with his father in the Mr. Robot computer shop, uh, Elliot, after revealing that he did steal $20 from a customer, his father asked him what movie he wanted to watch, and the movie selection was like Time Cop, Stargate, and Pulp Fiction, which uh, was in the newspaper, like the display of the movie poster, and that was the film that Elliot picked. Uh, his father was like, you know, was go to Time Cops, Stargate, which I think at the time were like PG-13 movies. Pulp Fiction was rated R. And that was the movie they went and, uh, and saw. Now, that's where I got my idea for the Washington Township plant is in MacGuffin. Still kind of on it, but I need to probably see more reveal from the series if that is the case. Um, not sure. You know, it could be something else. But uh, Pulp Fiction is known for using a fictional device, a movie device or trope, if you will, called the MacGuffin. And the MacGuffin is where there's an object that is um, not often seen or it's something that's passed among the different characters as a compelling push to move the plot. Um, Alfred Hitchcock wasn't the one who coined the phrase, but he's the one that actually like kind of popularized the term. Uh, he's been known to use it, and uh, his allusion in in Pulp Fiction itself as the movie, as we're going to the review, uh, the briefcase in the in the film is a MacGuffin, a way to propel the characters to different places and points uh, throughout the story. Uh, the other two points, and there may be even more, I might have to do like a rewatch of season one and season two, because this show is pr- pretty well layered. Uh, we've seen that with the Angela questions, when she was being questioned by uh, White Rose, if you look back in season one when she was at her home, you got an answer to one of the questions is what kind of animal you are. And her choices were a seagull or a giraffe. And if you go back through season one, you saw the answer to that potentially the question that Angela would have answered. Um, it's displayed in her, her, her uh, childhood home. Another illusion is, of course, the red wheelbarrow, which is the name of the book or journal that Elliot was... Uh, during season two when he was in the prison uh, journaling in as a means of controlling Mr. Robot. It's also the poem that Tyrell told uh, Elliot was the only bit of English his father knew and it's also the name of the barbecue restaurant and the operation or the code name of the operation for stage two. So there's a lot of direct references, um, indirect references throughout the series in itself that pay dividends as the series grows on, goes on. And so we're going to I'm going to do my review of public fiction, but there were two things that happened this season that were like kind of direct references to Pulp Fiction. One was a Tyrell Wellick and Elliot scene in which, um, I want to say Elliot, but Mr. Robot, when Mr. Robot went and tried to kill Tyrell Wellick on the night of the hack, of the 5-9 hack, and the gun misfired. And you have Tyrell stating that this is a sign, you know, a sign from God which is an illusion from Pulp Fiction, and I'll, when I t- talk to the review, I'll, I will talk about that part. And then you have uh, the recent episode, Legacy, and, and, yeah, not Legacy, is it Legacy? No, it's Metadata. This is the title of the recent episode, episode four, where Darlene gives back to the pickpocketer her, um, her wallet, and basically all she asked for was, you know, the picture that was in the wallet, and just gave it, gave it to to the uh, pickpocketer. Uh, that is also kind of a little twist in the whole Pulp Fiction thing. Um, there might be some other types of illusions that are going on. Like I said, I might have to do a rewatch. And there might be even further re- references in, in this season. But let's let's talk about the film Pulp Fiction. It's a it's an older film. It's a, almost... Yeah, it's almost 20 plus years old. It's 25 years old of a film. It came out in 1994? I believe. Let's check that. So, hold on. The film was published. Yes, it came out May 12th of 1994, which um, I believe 
this might be an issue when it comes to the timeline of Mr. Robot for the simple fact that I believe the death date on the tombstone for Elliot's father is February 15th of 1994. I'm going to have to double check that. But yeah, the time date is May 12th, 1994 is when the film came out. It stayed in the movies all the way to October. Uh, movies back then stayed much longer. You know, the DVD VH market um, was popping at the time. Uh, normally at that time, it took about a year for movies that came out at that time to go into that, you know, secondary market, as it's called. It's before, well, before streaming services and things of that nature. Um, movies now, when they go in the boxes, have a much shorter window. Uh, sometimes it's weeks, sometimes it's, you know, maybe three months or, or at the most. But here we go. Uh, so... According to IMDb, Pulp Fiction is about the lives of two uh, mob hitmen, a boxer, a gangster's wife, and a pair of diner bandits intertwined in the four tales of violence and redemption. It's directed by Quentin Tarantino. It's written by Quentin Tarantino, uh, Roger Arvey. It stars John Travolta as Vincent Vega, Uma Thurman as uh, Mia Wallace, Samuel Jackson as Julius Winfield. Uh, it also has Bruce Willis as Butch. It has an appearance with uh, Eric Schultz as Lance. Roseanne Arquette is in this movie as Jody. Uh, Vin Raines is Marcel Wallace. And who else is in the film? Um, oh, Harvey Keitel is Mr. Wolf. Uh, that's pretty much the bigger actors. Uh, you have Phil Lamar. Um, one of his early movie, peer movie peer appearances. He is playing Marvin. And he's known for Mad TV and Comedian, as well as voiceover work for both video games and uh, cartoon series. Uh, and you also see a lot of other character actors in this film. Um, what else? Who else popped up in this film? That is somebody. Oh, Amanda Palmer. Uh, Tim Roth is in this film. Uh, Tim Roth, of course, was in Reservoir Dogs, as well as Harvey Keitel. Um, Samuel L. Jackson, of course, has appeared in... The Hateful Eight, Django, and Jackie Brown are the movies he's... Oh, and he also played it in Kill Bill. So he's been in a few Quentin Tarantino movies, as well as um, Harvey Cartel. I believe he's popped up in a couple. Um, who is that? Oh, Steven, Steve Buscemi, who also was in Reservoir Dogs, and has popped up in a couple of... Um, Harvey, uh, he was in Reservoir, uh, Reservoir Dogs, and he played a, like a cameo appearance here in Pulp Fiction. And I believe he did one other appearance in um, um, one of Quentin Tarantino's movies. So he has a you know go-to actors in with of course, from the Kill Bill Volume One, Volume Two. Uh, so there's people he you know he goes to. There are his character characters or character or preferred actors to play certain roles. Sometimes he specifies or writes for them. Um, Michael Madison is one of those actors as well. He was in Kill Bill Volume 1 and 2. He doesn't make an appearance in here, but uh, he was in Reservoir Dogs and stuff like that. Um, who else? Trey. Yeah, Steve, Steve Spishimi. Um, I think that's pretty much it when it comes... Oh, Kathy Griffin shows up in the film. She had like early in her career, like a couple lines I think in the film itself. So we need kind of, if you're watching it, you can kind of look out for those actors. I think it pretty much covers the cast. Um, on Rotten Tomatoes, it is 94% uh, fresh, so it's a fresh rated movie. It has an audience score of 96%, with an average rating of 4.2 out of 5. Of the uh, critic reviews, it has a 78 review count. Um, the rating is 9.1 slash 10, with uh, 73 rated as fresh or weighted as fresh, with only 5 rotten reviews. Who would diss this film? <laughs> um, it has about a runtime of 154 minutes, and of course, it's um, published by Miramax, Miramax Films, um, which was a independent film distributor and became big. And of course, Harvey Weinstein was one of the producers on the film, and there's all that controversy going on there. All right, so let's kind of go in a little bit of the details of Pulp Fiction, a little bit from the Wicca. And this is the key part I want to talk about. Um, it has basically seven parts. It has a, a prologue called The Diner, a prelude to Vince Vega and Marcella Wallace's wife, Vince Vega and Marcella Wallace's wife, prelude to The Gold Watch, The Gold Watch, The Barney Situation, and an epilogue, The Diner. So it's um, four stories told in seven parts. It's not a linear story, it jumps around. 
Um, basically, the end is the beginning, and the beginning is the end. Um, there are also in the end. It's 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 a different style of film style. You know, Quentin Tarantino is known for his sappy dialogue, his stylistic directing style, um, his characters, if you will. And it's a very well. It was a very well received film at the time, both of critical and box office success. Uma Thurman received an Oscar nomination. It revitalizes uh, John Travolta's career, which was waning since like basically the 70s. He was known probably pretty much from the 80s doing those baby movies, it was Baby Talk or Baby Something. And from there, he was able to jump um, into mainstream again, if you will. He did like what is called like a comeback. Uh, Bruce Willis um, in this film is credited for basically starting the movement where you see um, mega movie stars, superstars, stars that if you put them on the building, building of a film, even if it's a dud, um, you're kind of guaranteed at least making your money back because um, of their star power, their likability, if you will. Some of that has waned within the last decade, but he is one of those mega stars for doing small independent films. And so you started seeing, um, you know, Tom Cruise was known for this. Uh, when he did the movie with Jamie Foxx, I, call, I think it was like the Confidential or something where uh, Jamie Foxx was driving a cab and Tom Cruise was like his hitman going on a list and killing people. Um, popularizing that were actors who might have been afraid to take some type of any film, even though they had the acting chops to do it uh, because of their reputation or thinking it might diminish their box acting power. You started seeing that a lot, um, and it exploded in the 90s into the aughts, and it's still something that's trending today. You're kind of now seeing that with television, where you have movie stars being in TV series. And normally when that p movie stars go to television, it's because they're, they no longer have, you know, that box office drop. And now you're seeing current box office megawatts, if you will, going on to television shows, either for a season or as a character actor or popping up here and there. Or producing writing stuff like that so there's a lot of diversification and Pulp Fiction has known that um, it's also known of helping kind of launch the independence movie movement again in the 90s you know you had a clerks you had most you had Pulp Fiction Reservoir Dogs um Al Machino which is the Elon not Elon Roth uh, Robert Rodriguez directors a lot a lot of films independent films Hollywood started taking risk on smaller movies a little uh, movies that had a little niche or cliche or something like that, and, and, and it started, you know, moving within films. Um, but as far as basically the purpose of for this review, you know, I, I've i always loved Pulp Fiction. I saw it pretty much around the time it came out. Um, and then, you know, over the years, you know, I've seen the film both on television and, you know, streaming and DVDs and stuff like that. It's a great film. It's... Uh, very easy to get engaged with and, and find something humorous or find something new within the film. Um, it's a fun film. Um, it's violent. So if you're not into violence, just so, so you know there's violence language, violent language and stuff like that. Some, it's a Quentin Tarantino film. So you, you kind of have to know that going in. Um, you know, I'll get five out of five stars, you know, two thumbs up. All the Marbles, if you will, is a, is a great film. For, but for the purposes of Mr. Robot, um, the two you know, key give up or takeaways I want to say is probably the, the structure of the film might have some kind of influence to Sam Ismail. He does make a lot of odes uh, structurally, you know, visually, um, as well as um, dialogue wise from various different um, big movie and even some sense television or um, artists in general um, throughout Mr. Robot. And maybe the structure of the show, particularly unreliable, the unreliable narrative that is Elliot. Some of it is kind of like that where we saw from you know the 5-9 hack we didn't know what's going on and we basically had to work backwards to kind of get to that moment and we could actually be working backwards the whole, the whole time. This could be a, one big flashback. Who knows? But I do think the structural in, um, influences of uh, putting different pieces in different places and the flashbacks that are happening. I know a lot of people um, when doing the criticism of the show both positive and negative attribute the flashbacks to Lost, which really popularized that on television. But I think it's more akin to Pulp Fiction, where the flashbacks add to a character, stronger character narrative. Um, they're much shorter. Um, on Lost, they're a little bit longer, sometimes a full episode, if you will. Um, we kind of saw a full episode of that with the Legacy episode about Tyrell Wellick. But I think it's more influenced um, stylistically by the Pulp Fiction template, if you will, than the Lost template. So there's that as far as the influence of Pulp Fiction on the show. 
Oh, of course, there's also the character shoutouts. Um, in the film, Julius Winfield and Vince Vega go to perform a hit on a crew of guys that have a piece of property that belongs to Marcellus Wallace, played by Vince Vega, and it's a briefcase. We don't know the nature of how they obtain the briefcase or what's in the briefcase. All we know is that it has a significant value to Marcel, Marcel Wallace, and they didn't deliver it to him. So they were, uh, Vince Vega and Julius Wallace were sent to retrieve it. And in their encounter, which is broken up into two different parts, um, you know, they kill the guys except for one who was their informant. But there was one guy that was in the bathroom hiding out, if you will, after they killed Brett. Brett with the big brain, if you ever heard of that. Um, they killed him, as well as the guy that's sitting on the couch. And... In comes the third guy with his big hand cannon, and he starts firing. It's like a six-gun revolver or something to that nature. And it looks like he's pointing directly at them, um, Julius and Vince Vega, and none of the bullets hit. So it was either a complete misfire, at first you thought, until you see that there's bullet holes right in the same location that they were. Now, these bullet holes could have already been there. Really wouldn't make sense. Or, as uh, Julius Vernon was, is a sign of God. Like, God came down, somehow caught or stopped the bullets as he talks to his partner about this. And it's a sign from God and that his purpose, if he will, is to no longer do what he's doing, which is a hitman. He's going to retire from the game and go and walk the earth and get into all these misadventures like Kung Fu. And Vince Vega, who is... Um, you can say more agnostic. He doesn't believe the whole God thing. He doesn't agree with Julius Ver Julius's version of the events. He thinks it's just one of those things that can happen. It does happen. You know, they, they just didn't hit because there might have been something wrong with the gun. And he thinks Julius is just off his rocker. And the whole idea of him walking the earth is that he's being a bum and that he is, is a dumb idea, basically. And so you have these two juxtapose, one of a belief system of believing in a higher power and finding a purpose in this moment and Julia saying you're off your rocker kind of Looney Tunes which is kind of like a similar situation would happen with uh, Mr. Robot and Tyrell where Tyrell saw the must fire as a sign of God that he and Elliot were supposed to be partners together and we'll get into that when I do my review of metadata but they were supposed to be partners together this is meant to happen that's why there was a misfire they belonged together and he even encouraged the whole you know putting the gun to his head of having Mr. Robot shoot him again, which Mr. Robot didn't do, and even if he had done so, the gun wouldn't have gone off. It would have probably blown up anyways, as according to the information that Irvin gave gave to us. But now that we know a little bit more about Irvin, maybe that might not be so reliable. But as I did my review on the at the time, that was episode one. No, it was a uh, legacy. Um, a little knowing a little bit about guns is still within the realm of probability that you know the squid bullet being at a hot in that hot popcorn thing would have done some may have done something to the bullet in itself not so much for the gun but the bullet that's why it was misfired but um and the rest of the bullets in the um uh, in the uh clip but so you have that that's kind of a direct influence and throughout the whole movie of Pulp Fiction, there's a whole belief system of believing either in yourself or believing in trying to obtain something better for yourself and trying to grab that by any means necessary. Um, you see that within the Butch story, which is Bruce Willis. He plays a boxer that's supposed to take a dive. He doesn't. He actually kills a man in the ring, and he goes on the run. He tells, I think it was his brother or somebody, to lay down these books on um, betting on him, and he wins a bunch of money, and he and his girl are going to take this money and leave so leave the city that doesn't happen a bunch of shenanigans happen as butch tries to go get um retrieve a watch he was in a little hideout if you will with his girlfriend his fiance um go back going back to his apartment to get this watch his father <laughs> his father had his father who died in vietnam and um, christopher walken oh forgot christopher walken is in his uh he was in another Quentin Tarantino movie that wasn't um, directed but was written by him, it was directed by Tony Scott called uh, True Romance. It's an infamous um, scene between Dennis Hopper and Christopher Walken where Dennis Hopper talks about how Sicilians came into existence, if you will. Great scene. You can find it on uh, YouTube or even Reddit. It's, it's something that's just a clip that's shared all the time. Um, 
The True Romance is also another great film. Great Tony Scott film. Great um, Quentin Tarantino script. Um, I think that script wasn't, well, my understanding was rewritten, but a lot of the structure still kept the same. I think there's even a special edit where it kind of goes to Quentin Tarantino likes to do the chapter thing and f move around the narrative, if you will. Um, there, I think it was structured, either potentially structured or the talk, I'm not sure. Disregard that. Um, but basically, he goes back and retrieves his watch for his, for his father for his purpose. You know, he is something that's meant for him, passed down, if you will. And uh, he ends up killing John Travolta's character, who's been waiting for him in the apartment uh, because they're going after them because he was supposed to take a dive. He didn't. Um, he kills Vince Vega, who um, was there alone because Julius wasn't there. Julius had left to go wander the world, which makes you wonder if Vince Vega had been in the bathroom and Julius might have been in the apartment with him. With you know, would he have died? if he had the same belief that maybe he should get out of this existence, but that's not what happened. He ended up dying um, in the tub, where if you look, and some alluded to the fact that the same placement of bullets that were meant for him earlier happened when um, when he gets killed by Butch. So that might be something that could be happening on Mr. Robot. Who knows? Um, like, for example, Tyra Wellick could, I think, and we'll get into my review, on Medijai might no longer be with us. We'll, we'll see. Um, but that could be a potential illusion that could happen on um, this season, on this show. What else happened? Sorry. Um, so, and then Butch ends up wandering into Marcel as well as who obviously want to be on hands to catch Butch who cost him a lot of money. And they get into some other shenanigans there. Um... Oh, the wallet scene. So the wallet scene is another very interesting scene. If you ever see somebody that has a bad motherfucker um, wallet, um, something that was Julius Winfield's wallet, he has he's getting robbed at the diner, which is being robbed by the Tim Roth and uh, Amanda Pollard, Pollard characters are robbing this diner, getting the cash uh, from the register as well as the wallets from the patrons. Amanda Palmer plays a character called um, Yolanda. So be cool, Yolanda. You might have heard that expression. And Tim Roth's character, what is it? His, na his name is Pumpkin. And he's sitting down and he um, opens up the briefcase because um, at this point, and this is the end of the movie, Julius and um, Vega had their conversation about, you know, Wallace leaving um, the life, if you will. And Julius goes, again, goes to the restroom <laughs> um, as this goes down. And not Julius, but. Vince Vega, John Travolta's character, and um, Tim Roth wants a suitcase. And he says, Julius is like, I can't give you a suitcase, this doesn't belong to me. And, you know, he puts a gun at him, and he goes, do you think this is the first time I have a gun? And then and Tim Roth goes, I'm going to kill you. And he goes, you know, here. So he opens up the case, shows it to him, and he also actually ends up taking the gun from Tim Roth. Points it at him. His partner, Amanda Palmer, doesn't like it. That's where you get the be cool. You don't want to be cool like Fonzie line from. And uh, to calm her down, he shows what's inside. It's a, this big bright yellow. Anytime the case opens, it's this big bright yellow. You have no idea what's in the in the case. And uh, basically he hands him his wallet. He says, you can have the money in, 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 the, in the wallet. Um, but he's keeping the actual wallet itself. And... Um, Tim's Ross here is wondering why you're doing it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not buying back this case or anything like that. I'm buying your life, buying a piece of moment, a piece, you know, of existence. And he talks about, you know, this is a whole speech that uh, Samuel Jackson is known for, which is Ezekiel. I should know this. I'm not going to look it up. But he has this whole speech from the Bible that he uses to intimidate uh, people with. And he says it again, but he realizes he's, he's been saying it wrong. Uh, or thinking about it wrong, and that he should be actually protecting his brother, uplifting his brothers, instead of annihilating his brothers, if you will. And so he gives the money to Tim Roth and says, you know, go about your business. He keeps the case. Uh, him and Vin Vince Vega eventually leave the diner and go their separate ways, and that's the end of the film. And that's very much similar to Darlene's. You know, she's realizing what they have done with the 5-9 hack, and the fact that, as she stated, and metadata, and we'll go more into it in the review that you know she stole from everybody. And when she realizes she got pickpocketed by the pickpocketer, she's like, you know, you can have all this. It's it's not relevant. It's not important. It's you know something I owe you anyways. 
because I stole from you. I'm responsible for all of this. She just wanted her photograph of her brother and her family um, at some point in the vacation, if you will. They're all together in this picture. It seems like the maybe perhaps the one happy moment that they have. Um, so there's that allusion to that's where that scene comes from. Um, allusion to that scene. It's a very famous scene. So if you see the bad motherfucker wallet, if you ever wonder why that's popular, it's because of the Pulp Fiction movie. Um, and I think that's all there really is to the film, besides the, you know, basically the structure of the film in of itself and the flashbacks that are heavily utilized and some of the key points I've already made. I think it's a very good film. I think if you like the Mr. Robot, and if you haven't seen it before, I highly recommend watching it so you can kind of see some of the cinematic influences the film has on it. And now everyone talks about, you know, uh, Fight Club being the big one on um, on the show. Um, if you haven't already seen that, I, I might actually do a review of Fight Club and The Matrix. You just kind of do some movie reveals, reviews there um, about those films and their influences on the show. But that's it. That's my review. I highly recommend it. Um, and the links to the show, um, you can find an Amazon link where you can um, purchase a DVD if you want to, either DVD or Blu-ray. I do know that it is also um, available, you know, through iTunes and um, Amazon, as well as it currently streaming on Netflix if you have Netflix. So that's it. Um, until next time, um, I'm Hiroshi Shive, and I'm logging off this chat. Bye, friends.